Hello, welcome back to Teaching the Bible Cover to Cover. I'm Michael Koch, and uh, again, this is a Bible teaching series where basically the, Bible, the entire Bible is taught cover to cover, starting in the book of Genesis and moving progressively through. Um, today, we're going to cover the book of the books of Philippians, Colossians, one and two Thessalonians, and one Timothy. Again, I'm. Uh, doing the teaching now from my basement due to the coronavirus. Normally I would teach it every week to the congregation in my church and a Bible study at St. Joseph the Worker Church, um, but due to the coronavirus everything is shut down. Um, this teaching that I'm doing has received an imprimatur from the Catholic Church, which means they reviewed the materials and deemed them to be free of any theological or moral error. So feel free, any Catholics who use this in the Catholic Church, but this Bible study isn't just for Catholics, it's for anybody who wants to learn the Bible. So hopefully it will be helpful to anybody. Um, to see these videos, aside from this one, I have 24 others. This will be the 25th in the series. Go to YouTube on the internet, type in Michael Koch, M-I-C-H-A-E-L, space K-O-T-C-H. Click on the Holy Bible icon and you'll find the whole video teaching series. Again, this will be, I believe, the 25th. And uh, probably about four more, and at that point, then the entire Bible will be covered. It's good for use, not just for personal use. You can use it in churches. You can use it in Sunday schools. Um, you can use it to teach your children. So hopefully, it will be beneficial to you. Let's start off with prayer. God, I thank, we thank you for your protection during these, these scary and dangerous times. You know, with this coronavirus, the whole world is basically kind of shut down. You know, thank you so far for protecting me and my family and all of my loved ones through this. Please protect everybody listening to this and protect everybody in the world. For those who are struggling with the coronavirus, if they may have hit you personally or family, please heal everyone up quickly and please give everybody strength to go through with whatever we have to go through. May this be a time of turning to you, God. Maybe you allow this to happen so the whole world turns to you and realize that we need you. I don't know. But I know I need you and my family need you. For those who have passed away because of the coronavirus, please make it so that they go straight to be with you in heaven and no longer have to worry about any kind of illness, but are with you in paradise forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we're picking up where we left off. We left off, I believe, with the book of Ephesians, uh, we're in the New Testament, and now we're going to the book of Philippians. These are letters that the Apostle Paul wrote to the churches, the various churches. Um, and this one is the, to the church of the people in Philippi. So, um, when he wrote this letter, Paul was with uh, one of his accomplices, one of his friends named Timothy. And um, he was with him when he wrote this particular letter. So let's get started. In Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, Paul says... Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are Philippi, with the overseers and the deacons. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, what he writes next makes us believe that he might have been written this letter while he was in prison. Um, it seems like for, from here on out, a lot of letters that Paul writes to the various churches, he's writing to the churches, but he's writing them from various prisons somewhere, or the same prison. Um, so this is Philippians chapter 1, verses 6 to 7, and Paul says, I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right, for me, it is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers of me with grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. That was Philippians chapter 1, verses 6 to 7. Um, the next one, uh, passage from Philippians, kind of confirms that he is actually in prison somewhere. And he is, again, the Bible says, all things work for good for those who love the Lord and uh, according to his purpose. So does Paul want to be in prison? Of course not, you know. But is God uh, allowing his imprisonment to be used for good? Yeah, he is, and, and you'll see here. Um, so Paul states, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. So it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to the rest 
that my imprisonment is for Christ. So while Paul is in prison, he is basically preaching the gospel to his captors, who are pagans in the imperial guard, and they all know about Jesus now because of Paul's imprisonment. I don't know if they follow him, but they're aware of at least Jesus now because of, of Paul preaching while he was in prison. Paul then says, And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, and much more bold to speak the word without fear. So Paul lets us know, too, that the other Christians in the area, um, seeing Paul in prison for his faith in Christ, and his bravery in prison, that is strengthening them. And it's making them rather, be, instead of becoming more fearful, Paul's faith while he was in prison is making them become uh, able to speak more boldly and without fear about Christ. Paul says, Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for defense of the gospel. And that was Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 and 16. Paul realized that he may eventually face death at the hands of his captors. Uh, he has been in prison numerous times for preaching about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yet he also realized that since he is a follower of Jesus, remaining alive or dying both have benefits. And he's trying to figure out which he would rather do. Is it, uh, would it be better for me? He, he said, I'd rather be up in heaven with God. That would be so much better for me. Better for me, Paul. But it would be better for you if I stayed here and did my good work for you. So he's not sure which, which he would rather do. You know, go to God to please himself, or stay here on earth and do more good works for God to help other people. So this is what Paul says. And this is Philippians chapter 1, verses 18 to 26. Apostle Paul says, Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. And it is my eager expectation and hope that I will... Oh, I'm sorry. Wrong one. Wrong one. Let me back up. That's the next one. Um, this is Philippians... No, that's right. That's right. Um, let me start that one over. I'm sorry. Yes, and I rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, that this will turn out for my deliverance. As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, it means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. It's far better for him. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so you may have ample cause to glory in Jesus Christ because of my coming to you again. So Paul wrote it out in his mind and he said, I'd much rather be with Jesus, but I'm only helping myself that way. If I stay here, I might suffer, but I'm going to stay here because I can do good work for all of you. Okay, next, Philippians chapter 1, verses 27 to 30. Paul says, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faithful gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction but of your salvation and that from God. So what Paul is saying, you know, um, let me read it again. Because uh, when, when people stand firm in one spirit or one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel and not afraid of anybody who comes against them because of the gospel, this sends a message to the opponents of God that we're in trouble, you know, that, you know, they're banding together and no matter what we do, they're not afraid, and it, it testifies to uh, their salvation, but it also testifies to the opponent's destruction. So when they see Christians gathering together and remaining strong in the faith and not caring what anybody does, the opponents of God start to tremble because they, they realize what's happening, that they're saved and we're in big trouble. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, 
but suffer for his sake. Engage in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. Okay, the next is Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. And in this, Paul lets us know that God always wants us to love others and care for other people. That is a message throughout all the Bible. God's, one of God's main things he wants for us to do as followers of him is to love other people, treat them well, and care for them. So the Apostle Paul says, Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as a thing to be grasped. But he made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even a death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him, and bestowed him on, on the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Okay, next is Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 to 11. Paul says, Whatever gain I had in fleshly things, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of surpassing worth of knowing that Christ Jesus is my Lord. So Paul says he would much rather know Jesus that is so much more important than having earthly treasures. Paul says, For Jesus' sake, I suffer the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. So, what Jesus is saying that he becomes righteous by having faith in, in God. You know, and it, what it says is that um, if you have faith in Christ, Jesus gives you righteousness. It's like a, a gift. And it does, it's not given you because your works, it's given you through faith. Now, from here on out, at least I spoke about this last session, you're going to hear about faith a lot, about you will get all these different benefits and rewards from God because of faith. Again, in this context, what is faith? Specifically, faith is knowing who God is, you know, know the Bible, know what it says in here, believing it, believing in God, and following Him, following what He says in your life, and trusting in Him. So if you know God and believe in Him and trust in Him and do what He says, that's having faith in God. And as you'll see from here on out, and we saw last session too, a lot of what we get from God is based on our faith in Him. You know, if we believe in Him and follow Him, He's our Father, He will do things for us. You know, but it's all based on how much do we trust Him and do what He says and follow what He says. Uh, let's see. Okay, next is Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 to 14. Paul says, Not that I've already obtained this, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Jesus made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it on my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. Paul tells us as Christians, we can't rest on our laurels. You know, it's good that we did good things in the past, but we need to keep doing good works. We need to keep following God and believing in God. There is no retirement as a Christian, okay? One who follows God, it's not like you at a certain point and, ah, I, I, I did good, I'm done, you know, if you still have life to, to live. He wants us always you know, not, well, I did good stuff, so I'm finished, but to continue to do good works, always pressing forward in good works, always pressing forward and following Him. Okay, next is Philippians chapter 3, verses 17 to 21. Paul says, Brothers, join in imitating me, and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. 
For many, of whom I have often told you, and now tell you even with tears, walks as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is their destruction, their God is their belly, and their glory they glory in their shame, with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body, by the power that enables him to even subject all things to himself. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, and in joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. You know, one of the things about having faith in God is not just having faith and believing, you know, in the hard things. He makes some wonderful promises to us, and we have to believe those too. Fantastic things that are supernatural. For instance, it says here, our citizenship we follow God is in heaven. We wait a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, this is Paul's quotes, who will transform our lowly body to be like the glorious body of Jesus. When we get to heaven, we are going to be transformed. We're going to have a resurrected body. It'll still be us, but it's not going to be this fleshly thing where we're losing our hair and my eyesight isn't good and I'm hunched over. And gonna, we're going to have some kind of resurrected body that is somehow similar to the body Jesus has in heaven. It says in the Bible, it's the word of God. Now, if you remember the transfiguration in the Bible when um, I think it was Peter, Paul, no, Peter, John, and James are on the Mount of Jesus and transfigured. He was so glorious when they saw what he actually looked like in heaven, they fell on their faces. God is going to do something like that for us. Now, I don't know exactly how it's going to be, and I'm sure it's definitely going to be lesser than Jesus because he's God, but it's going to be something like his, where I guess like a lesser version of his. Amazing, okay? We have good stuff coming our way if we follow God. Uh, Paul says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And let the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Okay, so Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 to 9. Paul says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard from me and seen in me, practice these things. And the God of peace and joy will be with you. So God says, think good, holy thoughts and do good, holy things in your life. Okay, Philippians 4, chapter 11 to 13, Paul says, Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So what Paul's saying is he learned to be content in any circumstance, rich or poor, uh, you know, feast or famine, because it's not the circumstance that sustains him, it's strength in God. As long as he is connected to following God, he is okay. So regardless of the circumstance, Paul is all right as long as he is connected to God and following him. If he unplugs himself from God, no matter what circumstances, then he's not okay. So it's not your circumstance that matters, it's are you following God in your circumstance, which will carry you through. Paul closes the letter to the Philippians, chapter 4, verse 19 and 20, by saying, And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory and glory forever and ever. Amen. Okay, now we're going to go over Paul's letter to the people in Colossae. It's a letter of Paul to the Colossians. Paul is with Timothy, again, when he wrote this letter to the Church of Christ at Colossae. Now this is Colossians chapter 1, verses 11 to 14. Paul says, May you be strengthened with all power, according to God's glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father, 
who has qualified you to share the inheritance with the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. Next is Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 20. Um, Paul says, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. By him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead. Now it says Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. It doesn't say he's the only born from the dead. Okay, if, if he was, it would say Jesus is the only born from the dead. He's the firstborn. He's the first one to rise from the dead. And, 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 but he's going to have a lot of followers, which is us if we follow him. So he's the firstborn from the dead, and we're going to follow him behind him as rising from the dead when we die, if we follow him. So he's in the beginning, he's the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him to reconcile himself to all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Okay, we're in Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 and 23. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, both doing evil deeds, Jesus has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach for him if you indeed continue in faith. Stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and which I, Paul, became a minister. Next, Colossians chapter 1, verses 24 and 27. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions, afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church, of which I became a minister, according to stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to the saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of his glory in this mystery, and the mystery is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Next, Colossians chapter 2, verses 8 to 15. Paul says, See to it that no one takes you captive of philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. Okay, so what Paul's saying is, you know, follow what the Bible says about God. Know that. Don't follow what people say that aren't from the Bible, that they just make up, because it's wrong. You need to know the Bible so you can know what is truly taught about God and what is a falsehood. For in him the fullness of deity dwells bodily in Jesus, and you have been filled in him, who is the head and rule and authority. You have been buried with Christ in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith, in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you who are dead in your trespasses, God made alive together with him, Jesus, having forgiven us all of our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with his legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. So how did he disarm the rulers and authorities. If we go back to when Jesus was tempted by the devil in the wilderness before he died on the cross, when he began his ministry, Satan brought Jesus up to a mountaintop and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. And Satan said, I will give you all these because I have authority all over all of them because they have been given to me and I give you who I will. You know. So when man fell, and all men sin, Satan gained authority over all of mankind because they're all sinners. When Jesus died on the cross, he took that back. He defeated death. He overcame death. He overcame Satan. 
So as before, Satan had claimed to everyone because everyone was a sinner. Christ defeated him. If we follow Christ, you know, we're, Satan has no claim on us. He has nothing over us. We're taken out of him and put under Christ's domain. This is Colossians, chapter 2, verse 18. It says, Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism or worship of angels. Okay, the Bible says don't worship angels. Okay, worship only God. Colossians, chapter 3, verse... And again, that was Colossians, chapter 2, verse 18. Colossians, chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. says, Paul says, If you have been raised with Christ... Seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Let's see, what's this one? This is Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 to 10. Paul says, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil, desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, saying that you have put off the old self and its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Okay, Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 to 17, talks about the attitude that you should have as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus. Paul says, Put on then, uh, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And above all things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, and giving thanks to God the Father through him. Colossians chapter 3, verses 18 to 25. Wives, submit to your husbands, as is fitting to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they be discouraged. Whatever you do, work heartily, as if for the Lord, and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance of your reward. You are serving the Lord Jesus Christ. God's saying a lot of things, um, but one of the things about work is when you do work, work do your best and do quality work. You know, because God wants us to be productive, and things that we do, we're actually doing for Him, not for other people. So work as if you're working for God, and put your best effort into it. Paul then says, For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Colossians chapter 2, verses 2 to 6. Paul says, Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us, that God may open to us a door for the word, to declare the mystery of Christ, on account of which I am in prison. So he's writing this from prison that I might make it clear which is how I ought to speak, walking wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so you may know how you ought to answer each other or each person. Paul closes by letting you know, yes, he is in prison. So at the end of Colossians, it, this is Colossians 4, chapter 18, it says, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. So he's letting the people know he's writing these letters to them while he's in chains in prison. Okay, so now we move on. Uh, Paul's writing his first letter of Paul to the Thessalonians. Now in this letter, Paul at the time was with Sylvanus and Timothy when he wrote this letter to the Thessalonians. 
Paul starts off in 1 Thessalonians 1 verse chap, chapter 1 verse 1 Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians of God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ grace to you and peace uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 13 Paul says and we thank God constantly for this that when you received the word of God which you heard from us you accepted it not as the word of men but what it really is the word of God which is at work in you believers so Paul is reaffirming that the Bible what he's teaching isn't man's thoughts or man's writing it's the word of God he would know he's writing it okay you know 40 percent if you want to understand something about 40 percent of the new testament was written by paul and he's saying it's not me writing this i mean i'm actually moving the pen but it's god coming through me telling me what to write or actually jesus you know said in other things jesus will actually appear to him and tell him things so what he's writing is not his own thoughts or whatever it's coming straight from god and he's writing it down uh paul lets us know that um Satan uh, it was stopping him from meeting them. You know, Satan does not want us to do good works. Satan does not want us to teach each other about the gospel of Christ. You know, if you learn the gospel about Jesus and follow it, you're going to be saved. You're going to be pulled out of Satan's hand and given into the hand of Christ. He does not want that. Satan wants to be your ruler. He wants to kill you. He hates you. He wants to destroy you. And it drives him crazy when people are taken, snatched out of his hand that he once had and Christ took them because now they follow him. So Satan will do whatever he can to stop the message of Christ being proclaimed. So Paul says, But since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, in person, but not in heart, we endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face, because we wanted to come to you, and I, Paul, want to come to you again and again, but Satan hindered us. Okay, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 2-8. to eight. Paul says, For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. That, you know, uh, let me just stop there for a second. Whenever Paul seems to give us instructions on what not to do, sexual immorality seems to be the first thing he mentions. It's usually the first one. If it's definitely the top two. But usually it's the first one. We don't do these things, and sexual immorality is usually always first. That's how important it is to keep your mind clear. You know, this world today where we have pornography running rampant, I'm a Christian counselor, you know, and um, the number one thing that I deal with it, with men, and I mean males, not even men, I'm talking like ages 12 and up, the number one issue that they bring to me, whether they're single, whether they're married, I have clergy coming in with this, um, is, oh my God, I, I watch pornography, I don't want to watch it, but, but I can't stop myself. So, you want to keep your mind clear, you want to stay away from that, you know, not, not just that, but any sexual impurity, because if it wasn't that important to stay away from it, Paul wouldn't always put this as number one on his list of things to stay away from. And he almost always has this as number one. Okay, so, for you know what instruction we gave you through the Lord Jesus, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgresses the wrong of his brother in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all these things. As we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you, for God has not called us to impurity, but to holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Okay, next one is actually comforting. Um, he's letting us know that uh, for us who have Christian people we know, Christian family, Christian friends who have died, um, he's letting us know, don't grieve for them, you know, or don't grieve in your heart because if they follow Christ, they're up in heaven with him personally. Jesus took them. So if you know of people who, who love and passed away and they believe in God and follow God and follow Christ, they're with him right now. So this is what Paul says. He says, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who do not have hope. So if people don't believe in God, they don't have hope when their relatives die. But us who do follow God have ultimate hope. We know where they are. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, 
Even so, through Jesus, God will bring those with him, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. So it says, for those who follow Jesus, he takes them with him, you know, when they die. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry and a command, the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. And that was 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, uh, verses 1 to 6. Paul instructs us to be awake and aware that we won't be caught off guard when, if Jesus returns while we're still here. While, we're still, while we are still alive. So it's, Paul says, Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you who have no, you have no need to have anything written to you, for you are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying, There is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are children of light, you are children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. Connects is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9 and 11. Paul says, God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's good to know. Who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another, and build one another up, just as you are doing. Okay, and 1 Thessalonians M, chapter 5, verses 14 to 18, Paul says, We urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, and be patient with them all. See that no one repays evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and good to everyone. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Okay, now we move to the second letter of Thessalonians. As in the Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, he was with Sylvanus and Timothy when he wrote the letter, this letter to the Thessalonians. Okay, um, this is one of, he does this a couple times, he does it here, it's not as bad as some of the times, but um, the first thing, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verses 5 and 10, it's a very long run on sentence. I guess they wrote a little bit differently back then, and um, they didn't quite favor periods sometimes. So, I'm going to try to get through this. It's a very long sentence. Paul says, This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you are also suffering, since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, afflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. But I'd hate to have to diagram that sentence back in Aramaic class in fifth grade back then. That's a long sentence. Paul says, They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. When he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints, to be more of that, among all who have believed, because our testimony to you is believed. All right, this next one is, I got to do some explaining so you understand it. It's really deep. It's a lot of information. It's about the Antichrist and the second coming of, of Jesus. Let me take a sip of coffee and need for this one. says, this is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 and 12. Paul says, Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, 
either by a spirit or a spoken word, or a letter seeming to be from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way. All right, that's an entrance into what we're going to talk about here in the rest of this paragraph. What Paul is saying is, there's going to come a time, maybe all throughout history, where people are going to say, Jesus is returning, Jesus is back here, that's Jesus, go out and follow him, he's God, he's... It's a lie, okay, because... Jesus of Revelation and Paul here says there are specifically things that have to happen before Jesus returns. And one of them is the appearance of the Antichrist. And let me try my best to put this in a nutshell. Now, in about four sessions from now, we're going to cover the entire book, a summary of the book of Revelation. Um, and, but, so it, this is, but it's in this paragraph, so I've got to cover it now so you understand what, what's happening here. It seems, after going over the book of Revelation countless times, that um, at some point, you know, the Bible does end at some point. I mean, there is an end to the Bible, okay? And what, how it ends is, Jesus returns and he fixes everything in the end. He fixes all the sin. He fixes all of the, the destruction of the world. He fixes all of the evil. He, he comes back and he fixes everything. And he, he somehow blends heaven and earth together. Or there's a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem comes down and all blend together. And it's just supernatural, fantastic that I, we can't quite understand. It. It's kind of beyond what we can comprehend because we've never seen anything like that. And that's how it ends. But something has to lead to this end. And it seems that God decided that at some point, okay, how things are going like today, like now, you know, day-to-day -day regular stuff on earth where everything's all messed up and there's some good and some bad, but there's sin and all this stuff. This has to end. And he makes a distinct end point for this. And um, at, at some point, Jesus will return. But before that, there's going to be a period of time where there's going to be a seven-year period where the Antichrist arrives on earth. And what's going to happen is basically there's going to be a seven-year period where the devil is running around in a human form right out in the open. Okay? Right out in the open. So everybody sees him. He's going to be this world leader. And agents of God, which I mean good angels and, and messengers of God and prophets of God, are going to be out in the open too. Okay? So everybody sees these people. And during a seven year period, everybody has to make a choice. The for forced choice. You can't say, well, I don't know if I'm going to follow God or not. It's going to be a seven-year period where either you're going to follow the devil or you're going to follow God. You've got to pick one. You have to pick one because this period of time is ending, and everybody has to choose by now who hasn't. Okay? So what happens is during this time, this Antichrist rises up. And he's going to be this world leader, I'll get into more in the book of Revelation, who kind of leads this one world government. And um, he's running amok all over the earth. And at one point, Jesus returns and just speaks a word and destroys him. So he, this is what Paul's going to talk about now. Okay? And how this all, again, back to how this all started. All these things have to happen before Jesus comes. So his point was, if people are out there saying, hey, the Messiah is here, he's the Messiah, follow him. If the Antichrist doesn't come and, and cause the havoc on the earth out in the open, then whoever you see isn't Jesus because he says these things have to happen. So you're not misled and following. It sounds like in the end times there'll be a lot of false messiahs coming up and saying, I'm the Christ, I'm the Christ, I'm the Christ. Don't believe it if these things haven't happened. Well, what are some of these things Paul tells us? He says, uh, Let no one deceive you in any way. For that day will not come, Jesus returning, unless the rebellion comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, who is the Antichrist. What's the rebellion? When the Antichrist comes on the earth, for some reason, there's hardly any there's hardly anybody that's really following God at that point. Um, now, there's different philosophies. Some people say, well, that's because there's a rapture, and more people follow God were taken up. That's why they're not here. Others don't believe in a rapture, and, and it talks here about a rebellion. And sound, this is the future. Sounds like at some point there might be this huge rebellion against God, where so many people turn away from Him. But anyways, there's going to be a future period of time where hardly anybody believes in, in Christ, and um, that allows this Antichrist to come and rise. So he says that they will not come unless the rebellion comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed. 
the son of destruction, who oppresses and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. What does that mean? Talks about this in the Antichrist. So, during this one world government, um, in the future, and there's going to be factions fighting against him, so he doesn't control the whole world. But at one point, he's kind of this world ruler in general, and there's two of them. There's the Antichrist, and another comes with him, called the False Prophet. The Antichrist is this political military leader that kind of rules stuff. With him is this false prophet who tries to force the world to follow some kind of false religion or worship the Antichrist. Not sure what it is, but there's two of them. Now, the Antichrist is given seven years to rule on earth by God, again, so that people can see him plainly out in the open and God's workers out in the open and people got to pick one or the other. So while he's doing his thing, he comes on the scene as this great leader that has the answer to everything. Why? You'll see because he's possessed by Satan. So he has supernatural wisdom. Not good wisdom, evil. But, you know, there's going to be come a time in the future where there's all these world problems and nobody can find the answers. And this one guy rises up and seems to have all the answers to everything because Satan's giving him supernatural intelligence. So everybody goes, oh, we need to follow this guy. He's the only guy who can fix everything. Well, the whole world starts following him. And during this period of time, he lets the Jews rebuild the temple in Israel. So during a seven year period, the first three and a half years, he looks like kind of like the Savior. Like he's the only guy who can fix everything. Well, in the middle of the seven and a half year, the seven year period, three and a half years in, he walks into the Jewish temple in Jerusalem, that's rebuilt, sits on the throne, all the world's TV cameras are pointing at him, he's the world leader, and he says, Not only am I the world leader, I'm God. You must follow me. You must take the mark of the beast on your right hand or your forehead. If you do not have this, you're not able to buy or sell anything. And if you don't follow me, you're going to be killed. So he basically comes out, declares himself as God, and says, you, anybody who must take a mark of this loyalty to me, and if you don't, I'll kill you. Okay? Let me read that again. For that day will not come unless rebellion comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who presses and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. What I, what I just explained earlier was, we'll get more in the book of Revelation. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things, says Paul. And now you know what is restraining him now, so he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. The devil is already at work in the world, but he hasn't actually come out and taken over things, you know, like he will when the Antichrist rises up. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. So something's restraining this Antichrist from actually bursting forward and kind of ruling the world like he always wanted to do the devil. Something, someone, it's a he. Someone's restraining him. I imagine it's God, Holy Spirit God, but at some point, these things have to happen. God's going to back off, and he's going to push forward and take over this world leader. Let me read that again. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is out of the way. And when the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth, and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming, coming who Lord Jesus will uh, kill at the breath of his mouth. In the book of Revelation, this Antichrist gathers his army together and just wreaking havoc on the world. You know, it's like, imagine if like Hitler were during the Third Reich, if they were actually successful and they're just obliterating everybody, you know, who, who won't follow him. Well, anyways, he gathers his army and in some places in the Bible, it says it might be a 200 million man army, and it's crazy, you know, the number. And they, they gather into this plain of Megiddo called Armageddon. And he plans to just wipe out it, Jerusalem and Israel and just, you know, just take over everything. When the Antichrist is there with his huge army, that's when Jesus returns. Jesus comes down from heaven. Uh, the same way he went up, lands on the Mount of Olives. He hits it with so much force, the mountain splits. And half it gets pushed to the north, half it gets pushed to the south. He creates a valley. He walks out. The whole world sees him coming down, too. 
He walks out, gets on a horse of God waiting for him, charges in with, with uh, people from having fallen him, gets off his horse, walks up to the Antichrist, just says a word to him, and the false prophet. The ground opens up, and they fall into hell alive. And then Jesus says a word to his evil army that he has, and he just speaks a word, and they all rot and on the spot, die, and their eyes are out in their sockets, just fall over dead. So Jesus speaks a word to the end of Christ and to his army, and they fall. And then Jesus, the rightful person in the throne, walks into the temple, sits down on the throne, and says, No, you're not God, Antichrist. I'm God. And he brings perfect peace to the world, and he restores everything. So again, he speaks a word and destroys the Antichrist. And read this again. And when the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth, and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. We'll get into that and what I taught you more of was more of the book of Revelation. Okay? The coming of the lawless one, the Antichrist, is by the activity of Satan, with all power and false signs and wonders, and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing. So again, this Antichrist can be able to, the Satan gives him this power so he can do all these fall, these evil miracles and stuff to make him look like a god, but it's from the power of Satan and Jesus can just wipe him out immediately. But he does all these false signs and wonders, wicked deception by the power of Satan for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and be saved. Therefore God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who do not believe the truth but have pleasure on righteousness. So, people who refuse to believe in God while, you know, before all this or during it, you know, they heard of Jesus, they, they were taught about Jesus, they know him, they reject him. I don't want Jesus. I want to do what I want to do. I don't want to follow God. I'm the captain of my own ship. I, I don't need to answer to anybody. God says, okay, fine. He, he makes it so they won't be saved. He sends them this delusion so that they follow this lie of the Antichrist and they follow that instead of following God because they rejected God. So that was a lot, okay? Again, that was 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. Paul touches into a lot, a, a good chunk of what's talked about the Antichrist in the end times and Jesus' return. He gets into a lot more and then, but he gives us, you know, gives us an appetizer of what's coming in the Bible. All right, uh, but then Paul says, uh, chapter 2, Thessalonians 3, verse 3, But the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. And he finishes by saying in 2 Thessalonians, chapter 3, verse 13, As for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. Okay, so now we're going to do the first letter of Paul to the Apostle Timothy. He's not the, I'm sorry, he's not an apostle. First letter of Paul to Timothy. Now, this letter is a little bit different than every other letter. Um, every other letter written by Paul so far was to churches, to groups of people. This is written to one person. It's written to Timothy. Now, Timothy was like an apprentice of his. He followed Paul around. He was a big man in, in, the, in the, the church for God. He, but he was a, a, an accomplice of, of, of Paul. So it's a personal letter writing to Timothy, basically telling him how to run his life as a Christian, how to be a Christian leader, I guess. Um, so all the letters the Apostle Paul wrote up to this point are included in the Bible are letters to form, to newly formed Christian churches in various areas. The following letters to Timothy and Titus are personal letters. Timothy was a close friend of the Apostle Paul. He traveled with Paul and helped him spread the message of the gospel to others. Timothy and Titus were among the first leaders of the church. Timothy was the bishop of Ephesus. Titus was the bishop of Crete. These letters are called the pastoral letters because Paul is giving advice to them as church leaders. Below are excerpts of some of the things that Paul wrote to Timothy. This is 1 Timothy uh, chapter 1, verses 12 to 17. Paul, writing personally just to Timothy, says, I thank you who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent opponent. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith of love that are in Christ Jesus. 
The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. The Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners, of whom I am foremost. But I receive mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example of those who were to believe in him for eternal life. To the King of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and is pleasing the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved, to come to knowledge of truth. That's important. God wants everybody to be saved. He doesn't want anybody to go to hell. But He only saves those who want to be saved. Okay? He only saves those who want to be with God. Anybody who comes to God and calls on Him to save Him and follow Him, He will save. But you have to do that, because otherwise it'd be kidnapping. Okay? I mean, if you're a person that says, God, I hate you, I, I, I want nothing to do with you, get away from me, I don't want you in my life, God's not going to go, you're going to come with me whether you like it or not. No, that'd be kidnapping, okay? He won't take anybody who doesn't want to be with him. Because don't forget, we're talking about eternity. Eternity is forever, right? So people are with him and going to be with him forever. You have to want to be. If you don't want to be with God, he's not going to force you because, again, that'll be abduction, okay? But he wished, he wants everybody to follow him because in his will everybody will be saved he doesn't want anybody to go to hell but it's up to us you know he only saves those who want to follow him and be saved the other people he gives them their wish you don't want me fine you won't have me you go to a place where i'm not but he doesn't want anybody to do that that's why it's important to tell everybody about christ and how great he is and, and what he'll do for us because if we don't want him he won't take us you know um, he wish he wish everybody wants to be because it's free will. He could make us, you know, force us, uh, program us to want him whether we like it or not. But we'd be machines then, only doing what we're programmed to do. You know, he doesn't want machines that only follow him because they have no other parameters. You know, he wants us to choose him. But if it's his wish, if his will for us, everyone with free will to choose him and follow him, he wants all of us to be saved. This is good as pleasing the sight of God, our Savior, who desires that all people be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ, who, who himself, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is a testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, Paul says, Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, and believed on in the world, and then taken up in glory. Paul says that, you know, some, of, some people will depart from the faith in the latter days. Are we in the latter days? I don't know. I really don't know. Maybe yes, maybe no. You know, but whatever the latter days are, he lets know some people are going to drift away. Paul says, now the Spirit expressly says, and he uses a capital S, which means God, the Holy Spirit. So now the Holy Spirit expressly says, that in a lot of times, some will depart from faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and the teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God in prayer. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7-10, Paul says, Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training, bodily training is of some value, godliness training is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. For to this end we toil and strive, because we have our hopes set on the living God, 
who is the Savior of all people, especially those who believe. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, Paul says to Timothy, Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would encourage a father. Younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters, in all purity. 1 Timothy 5, 8, Paul says, If anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worth for an unbeliever. Do not be a deadbeat. Okay? If you have a family, you need to provide for them. You need to take care of them. Because God says, if you have a family, you don't take care of your own family, you're worse to God than an unbeliever. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 20. As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all, so that the rest may stand in fear. 1 Timothy verses 6 chapter 6, verses 3 to 4. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teachings that accord with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 to 12. Now there is great gain in godliness with contentment. For we, we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. So Paul's saying, look, as long as you have food and clothes, that's all you need. Everything else is gravy. But if you have food and clothes, you have enough, so be content with that. He says, but those who desire to be rich, and he doesn't say rich people, those who desire, I, I want to be a millionaire, I want to be a billionaire, I want to be rich, rich money, those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, uh, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. And it says, and this quote is often misquoted, so I'm going to clarify. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. <coughs> now, many people say, money, the Bible says money is the root of all evil. No, it doesn't. Money is a tool like a hammer. A hammer, you can smash somebody in the head with it and kill them, or you can build a house for somebody with it. It's just a tool. What you do with it is whether it's evil or good. Same thing with money. Um, money can be used for evil stuff, be used for good stuff. But you shouldn't crave money, okay? So let's read that again. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Now, there are lots of roots of evil. Oh, this is one of them. But when you think about it, some of the worst things that people do are because of money. Human trafficking for money. Prostitution to get money. Selling drugs to get money. You know, um, so, you know people will do the worst things to get money. And if they chase after money, you know, they're, they're in a huge snare. Um, it is through this craving, craving to be rich, that some of you have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Okay, the next is 1 Timothy, verse 6, chapter 13 and 16. <coughs> Paul says, I charge you in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at a proper time, who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Okay, the last thing in Timothy is he has instructions for rich people. You know, there's no one about it that says bad to be rich. It all depends on what you do with the money and, 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 and you know, how you got it or whatever. But, you know, there's nothing good or bad with being rich. So, Paul gives instructions for rich people how they're, how they're supposed to live their lives. So, this is 1 Timothy, verses 6, chapter 17 and 19. So, if you're rich, this is for you. Paul says, As for the rich of this present age, 
They should not be conceited, and they should not set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God. So if you're rich, don't put all your trust in what your money can do for you, because it may go someday. Put your trust in God, okay? Put your trust in God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. So if you have money, good for you, enjoy it, you know? But be generous with it, this is what Paul says. They are to do good, to do a lot of good works. You do a lot of good things if you have money. You can do, help out a lot of people if you have money. So they are to do good, do a lot of good works, and be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of what is truly life. So if you use your money to help other people and be generous and, and you know, somebody's poor and maybe pay their bills or you help them with food or help them with this or help them with that, you're storing up treasures in heaven. Because one day, your riches here are going to go. You know? um, it's like monopoly. I heard, I heard a preacher talking about this and it's true. Life is like a monopoly game, especially if you're rich. You know, so you start playing Monopoly and you start off with nothing and throughout your life, you know, you're, you start winning, you're gathering up, you're putting houses on, on, on your, your properties and you're putting hotels and, and you got all these houses and hotels, you get all the money, you know, I got everything and then the game's over and you got to put everything back and put the game away, you know, and you, you don't take it with you. That's what life is like, you know. Um, you don't want to store up things in life that at some point you got to give it all back. I can't take it with me. You want to store things up in heaven where you have forever. And one way to do that is if you're rich, be generous with your money and care for others. Use it as a tool to help others and, and spread God, you know, the word of God and the love of God. That's it for today. Um, next week we're going to cover the second letter of Timothy. And, you know, we're going to move forward again. I'm probably going to... Four more teachings, I believe, and that will be all throughout the whole Bible. Two more teachings on the letters of the apostles and the disciples, and probably two teachings to cover the book of Revelation, then we'll be done. Oh, I do one more teaching. Um, I'm going to reteach the book of Daniel, because when I did that teaching at our church, uh, I didn't set the microphone up right, so it was silent. So you see my mouth moving, and nothing came out. So it'll be five teachings. Uh, two teachings, two more letters, and we've done all the letters. Two teachings on the book of Revelation, and I'm going to reteach the book of Daniel. And that was actually a good one. So I'm looking forward to reteaching that. That was a good book. Listen, God bless all of you. Everybody struggling with the coronavirus, I'm praying for the world. Pray for each other. Be kind to each other. Care for one another. Follow what the government says as far as social distancing and stuff. Don't take this lightly, you know. But also, let the love of God come out in this time. Who knows? Maybe, you know, the reason why you're here on the earth at this this point in, in your life is for this moment. So that God's love is going to shine through you in caring for and helping others. I don't know how this is going to turn out, but God does. You know, and now more than ever, now more than ever, we need to put our trust and faith in God. Because this pandemic, boy, this is something, you know. And... I don't think man has an answer for it, but I know my Father, our Father, God does. So we put all of our faith and trust in Him. No matter what happens, we know what's going to happen in the end with Him in paradise forever. That's a certainty. Okay. God bless all of you. God love all of you. And God willing, we'll do another teaching about you know within a week or so. Take care.